So the uh, second part here is uh, we call it alternative perspectives. It's kind of a catch-all to allow us to introduce some, like I mentioned earlier, some of the leading edge stuff and give you a flavor for what that looks like and it also gives you some insight into how, how do we think about stuff and how do we come up with these uh, you know, ideas that we claim are different than most uh, people tend to come up with. And then I also want to give you one sort of uh, snapshot of some of the futures content we've developed around alternative perspectives. So a couple of theoretical frameworks and then some real life stuff that uh, I've used pretty frequently with, with public audiences. So you get a flavor for how do you translate this wacky stuff into useful, um, useful, thought, useful stuff. So the first idea is this integral futures and um, this, where this came from is a uh, one of the more, I guess, notorious uh, current philosophers. His name is Ken Wilber. He's written a whole bunch of books. Any any Wilber fans in here? No. Mr. Ed fan, but not a Wilber fan. Ah, uh, you like Mr. Ed, but not Wilber. All right. Well, I, I bet you there's the two people who are going to drink that Kool Aid and become Wilber aficionados. But anyway, um, so I drank the Kool Aid several years ago. But what, what he, so the, he's a, a philosopher, and what he tried to do, and he wrote a, a whole bunch of books about it, but this was the cool thing. He literally spent a year locked inside his, his um, Boulder mountaintop home. Uh, he'd already written several books up to this point, but he, he said he wanted to understand what are the commonalities amongst the, the world's great wisdom traditions. So he tried to study, like, you know, religious frameworks, social frameworks, developmental frameworks, philosophical frameworks. And he, he said he literally had his whole, his whole uh, um, living space was just filled with yellow pads of frameworks and, and lists and outlines. And what he found was, um, ultimately, if you, if you were to look at what were all these great traditions saying, you could sort it all into a two-by-two two matrix. <laughs> Now, as futurists, we totally agree with that because we have not yet found a problem that is not amenable to a two-by-two two matrix. So Wilbur does the same thing, right? And what he says is, if you want to understand any phenomenon, so if you put in the middle trend, event, issue, discontinuity, scanning hit, whatever it might be, if you put that in the middle, think of every, every trend, event, issue has an intentional aspect, a behavioral aspect, a social aspect and a cultural aspect. All right, so again, we're getting a, little, getting a little bit into the philosophy here. But what he's saying is, so if you want to really understand any phenomenon, you've got to understand what motivates it, what, how does it show up in real life in terms of behavior, what, does the, what are the cultural influences or context around it, and the social is what is the sort of systems and infrastructure around it. And so the, the two by two works like this. Is every, so every phenomenon has an interior individual aspect. So that's motivation, right? That's, this is us. This is what, what motivates us up in this corner. What's our motivation? Then we have an individual exterior. That's our behavior. What do we actually do? So we have motivation and behavior. Then again, the other piece of it is the um, collective aspect. So the collective interior is culture. Because you think about, you know, what is culture? You can't like go to the cultural su culture superstore and go find it. It's not, it's not really written down anywhere. It, we all kind of know what the culture is, and it, it's a, literally it's in our minds, right? What our cult, you know, the uh, the culture around a particular organization or even country, it's a sort of a shared collective understanding that we all kind of know, but you know, it's not really tangible per se. Um, so that's what the cultural aspect is. And then this last one, the collective exterior, these are the systems and infrastructures and support systems that are, you know, that, that are, we can physically see. Okay, so those are the four quadrants, right? So next, what he says is if you want to understand the world of behavior, this is the world of individual capability and behavior, there's, this is the, cha the concern in, in this quadrant is how do people act, right? You know, so voting patterns, reproductive practices, consumer behavior. So these are the measurable things, right? Measurable consumer behavior is up in this quadrant, right? And so he just gives you examples. So what are the tools that you would use to study, study this quadrant? What are the, you know, what are the, some of the texts and theorists and so on and so forth? So he's trying to give you some examples, like what, what is this quadrant concerned with? So this is the world of behavior. 
We all study behavior. If you, I know we had a couple of market researchers. Market researchers spend a lot of time looking at what the people actually do. Okay, that's first. Then we say the other sort of tangible aspect of any phenomenon is there's some kind of link to a support system or infrastructure. So this is the physical world, right? So this is, you know, uh, for instance, uh, you know, the, the internet is a uh, technological infrastructure. It's a tangible thing, right? It exists. It's a system. So this is, um, this, this realm down here are what are these big social support systems that are part of any phenomenon. Next, what, so what, is the, what does the culture have to say about our phenomenon? So this is, again, shared meaning. What do we all believe about a particular issue? And then finally, what's our, what is our individual motivation? So the shorthand that I often use for this is what are, what are people's values? So what, what do we use that helps us? What, motivated, what motivates us to do certain behavior? Okay. So that's the first outline. Now I'm going to give you some examples so it starts to make a little more sense. So if we took this, if we took an example of we want to understand how exchanging information is going to change in the future. So this is an actual example. I think, um, I can't remember. Well, we did a project for somebody where that was one of the concerns, exchanging information. So what this matrix says, if you really want to understand how exchanging information is going to change in the future, we need to understand what it looks like in each of these quadrants, right? So what's the motivation, right? So one example, now there's obviously, there's lots and lots of different motivations. I'm just going to show you one example. So one example about exchanging information is I as an individual might say, my motivation is I value privacy. That's what's important to me. So how would that show up in behavior? Well, I only open my Facebook file uh, to, print, to friends, right? Because you, you can have your Facebook profile open to everybody, or you can set it so only my friends can see my information. So somebody whose motivation is privacy, their behavior will reflect that motivation, typically. Sometimes we're contradictory, but anyway, we'll be consistent here. I value my privacy. My Facebook profile is only open to my friends. Now, there has to be a support infrastructure to enable that. So Facebook has to be able to, um, you know, block it, right? There ha you have to have the technical capability to act on your motivation the, uh, and translate your behavior. Does that make sense? So the only way that you can do this is if, fa if the technical infrastructure enables you to protect your privacy. And then the last, th the last quadrant over here is, what does the culture say about privacy? Right? So there's, there is a cultural viewpoint that says, well, hey, you know what? People can take advantage of my information for their benefit. So there's kind of a cultural worldview that says, mm, you know what? You better protect your privacy. Otherwise, you know, there's identity theft and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So what, we were say what we're saying is one of the ways that we, we, we help to broaden our thinking around trends and issues and, and scanning hits and such is when we, when we identify something, we try to think of the motivation, the behavior, the support structure, and what the culture says about it. And that little simple four quadrant thing, you can, you can plug anything in there and in a really quick and dirty. Now, because we could take the opposite example and say, you know, privacy is not a concern to me. My Facebook profile is open to everyone. We don't really, it's, it's, as long as Facebook exists, I don't even need Fireword firewalls. And, and if you were going to say the, the culture here is, you know, younger people, you know, the, the Gen Y culture is much more lax about privacy. They don't really care about it as much as like the baby boomers did. All right. So you, can, so you see how you can look at different phenomena and get a, get a quick reads on how does this fit into a larger context. Is everyone still with me? There's some like uh, apprehensive head nods. Um, so let's keep going. I'm going to give you like three or four examples, and I think at the end you're going to go, ah, I, it's going to click, right? So just to know, like, so if you want to understand, you know, the world of behavior, like here's the kinds of things that that's how behavior gets studied. You're into the psychology realm. This is the realm of anthropology, and then in the systems and infrastructure into the world of engineering, right? The key, one of the really key points, and the reason that I got all jazzed up about all this integral stuff when um, another futurist, Rick Slaughter, out in Australia introduced us to it, is if you think about the right-hand side, you can see behavior and you can see infrastructure. It's explicit. We can measure it. 
So this is the world, the, measure, the right hand side is the world of measurement. And you can, as you can imagine, most of the human race is very comfortable over in the measurable world. What happens when you get over here and you can't, you can't get inside my head and you really can't pin down culture, it's all sort of, right, it's all, it's interpretation. It's tacit and it has to be interpreted. Right? You can't go find this, you can't find the measurable evidence for it, right? You can do surveys, but that's, that's not the same. So you have to, you rely on interpretation here. So what's happened? What's happened over time, and this has happened to futurists, is futurists, one of the things that we perhaps are a little bit guilty of is we spend a lot of time over here because we get data and measurements and we feel more comfortable. And what Slaughter and some of the other people are saying is, we have got to spend more time in this squishy, amorphous, fuzzy land because we're missing you know, half the equation. So how do we as futurists get better in this murky space over here? It's easy here, right? You get data. But over here, you have to, you have to rely on interpretation. All right, so does that basic point make sense? Does that fit with your experience? that we're way more comfortable over here than over here? Right. And you can imagine, you know, internal audiences, right? Wait, that's an interpret, and I, this, I gotta tell, I cannot tell you, I, hardly ever do we do a consulting project in which this doesn't come up, and where the client keeps wanting to push us here. Where are the measurements? Where's the data? And we're like, well, you know, we're, we're over here, and our view as experts is, what do you mean your view as experts? That's an interpretation. Well, yes. But we're paying you for, but there's not data for this. You know, you get that, you know, that kind of look like, what do you mean there's no data? You know, like the, when the dog looks at you. <laughs> no data? No, it's an interpretation. And that's what, that's what, we, that's what, we, that's our value add. That's what we're good at. You can go get some monkeys to get the data for you. That's easy. You're, we're, this is the hard stuff. This is the value add stuff. Now, it's a tough sell, right? But that's, all right, okay. So that, so to me, that, when I first saw this, it's like, oh, so I, I've got to go over into this realm here and, and figure out how do I take insight from that realm and somehow convince the people over here that it's, it's worthwhile. Okay, so one more, uh, we'll do a couple of quick examples just so you get it. All right, let's take, let's just say we wanted to study the value, something around environmentalism. So one of the values that people might have is I want to do more to protect the environment. What's the behavior? People won't pay more for environmentally friendly products, right, often. So one of the things that happens is there's often disconnects between the quadrants. When we see disconnects, we go, aha, we like disconnects, right? Because wh why was there, why do you think there's been a disconnect between I want to do more to protect, but I won't pay more? What's one of the disconnects? What, what's one of the explanations for that, do you think? I want to do more, but I can't quite figure out how to do it. Well, so we go down and we look here and we say, you know what, um, there's the, the infrastructure, the infrastructure for you to do, to act out on protecting the environment has not existed until recently. 20 years ago, if you wanted to